my colleague, Betsy Rimes, who will introduce our speaker, um, also my colleague, Stanton Wortham. And, uh, but I'll just say very briefly, it's been a, an amazing day. Thank you all of those who already presented and dialogued and chatted in the halls. And um, good luck also to those who will do so tomorrow. And we'll be back here tomorrow morning at um, 8.30. Don't forget that. But for now, let's just enjoy this evening. Um, as soon as everybody's seated with your wine or whatever, um, you can begin. So uh, Betsy will introduce, Stanton will speak, and then if there's a little time for Q&A, we can do that. Um, all right. So Betsy, will you come up? Okay, good evening, everybody. Or, uh, it's good to see you all here. Thank you for coming to what promises to be an exciting talk. Um, something, someone rather difficult to introduce. Um, so I asked my children last night <clears throat> what I should say. Um, and <clears throat> but first, before I tell you what they answered, it also made me realize how long I've known Stanton. So, even though I'm much younger than him, <laughs> somehow we overlapped in college um, as undergraduates. And that was nearly 30 years ago. Um, so, interesting, way before my kids were born. Um, but what my kids said... Well, my son, who's 14, said, <clears throat> the people will probably have been enjoying the conference all day. They're excited about seeing Stanton, not you. So just acknowledge that and then say, so without further ado, here's Stanton Worth. So, um, which, of course, would be a very good strategy. Um, but my daughter, who's only six and a daughter, said, well, <clears throat> I think you should talk more about all the people he has helped and all the ways he's helped Penn. Yes, she really said that. <laughs> so <clears throat> I'm going to talk a little bit about that, starting with me. Stan has been a collaborator and an advocate of mine ever since we met so many zillions of years ago. In fact, um, when we were both still in grad school, we co-presented something at the American Anthropological Association meetings about microgenesis in educational settings. Remember? And which I now realize was a suitable topic for what was my very first presentation at an academic conference, microgenesis. <clears throat> and ever since then, um, Stan has included me in countless fun and also serious academic ventures, including a book that we co-edited called The Linguistic Anthropology of Education. But he has also helped many other people in many other ways. Uh, he is officially, I should tell you, the Judy and Howard Berkowitz Professor uh, and Associate Dean for Academic Affairs at the University of Pennsylvania's Graduate School of Education. <clears throat> he also has appointments in anthropology for the School of Communication and folklore. Folklore. So his work clearly cuts across disciplinary boundaries. And in this way, I would like to say he helps academia. His many publications like his teaching and his talks, as you will soon see, are clear, yet complex and useful. And I use them, or segments of them, in all my teaching and in my own scholarship. These publications include Narratives in Action, Education in the New Latino Diaspora, which he co-edited um, with Enrique Murillo and Ed Heyman. Um, the Linguistic Anthropology of Education, which we co-edited, and um, Learning Identity. And I'm looking forward to taking advantage of the help and clarity that will likely be part of his forthcoming book, due this fall, and co-authored with Angie Reyes, called 
discourse analysis beyond the speech of it. Um, so, as you will see tonight, Stanton has also been working with Mexican immigrants and <clears throat> Mexican American adolescents who live in an area of Philadelphia that has only recently become home to a large number of Latinos. And so he's been helping student researchers at Penn and schools in this community, often multimodally, by producing videos, segments of which I'm assuming you will soon see. So as my daughter would like to have me point out, <clears throat> and I concur, Stanton has helped not only me, but many other people, and many people right here in the bosom of Penn. And now, as my son Charlie would have liked me to begin this introduction, without further ado, here is the man you came to hear, Stanton Wortham. So today, I'd like to speak to you about this project that I've been doing with Mexican immigrants in a town near here. And at the same time, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about film and the affordances of film for representing academic research. And in order to start, I'd like to show you a film. So let's do this one first. GSC Films, run by Ahmed Das and Aaron Walters, has been instrumental in producing the videos. So I want to give you a sense of what I'm going to talk about during the presentation today, that I really have three things to say. That the first thing I have to say is that an object like this, this community, is an extremely complex object. So let's take a particular focus, something we might want to explain that I'm interested in out there is the developmental trajectories of kids who end up in the schools. So a Mexican kid who comes to this town as a child ends up in an American school in this town. The research question is, what are the various processes that are relevant to determining what kind of trajectory that child follows as the child moves through school and beyond? And in order to answer a question like that, I'm going to argue that we have to attend to heterogeneous sets of resources. We have to attend to resources from many different scales in order to try to make sense of it. We want to shy away from relatively simple theories that follow whatever the latest trendy account of immigration is. We want to see if we can understand the whole object in more of its complexity. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to try to see if I can articulate that point clearly for you. And the second thing I'm going to do is I'm going to reflect a little bit on the uses of film as a medium for representing academic research. So we want to report results of an ethnographic project like this. This is a long-term project. And how is it, how can we use film, what are the strengths and weaknesses of film for doing this? That one of the things it can do for us is it's able to evoke, it's able to give us a more embodied sense of the kinds of dispositions that go into meaningful experience in a place like this. When you see children like the last two children sort of frolicking around, blowing bubbles at each other. We use different devices when I was young. Nowadays we have these mechanical devices that can do it. But when you see children doing this, you can feel what it is that's happening there, the sort of joy, the lack of constraint in that, is something that you can feel when you see it in a movie. It would be almost impossible to articulate that in prose, that it would take remarkable skill to be able to do it. Very few of us have it. The other thing that films do well is they tell stories. There's a story in there about the development of this community, the relationship between the new immigrants and the existing communities and their complex histories. And these kinds of stories are things that film also does relatively well. So I'm going to try to talk a little bit about the affordances of film for representing or evoking these embodied dispositions, and also for telling stories and what that means, whether it's a strength or a weakness, or maybe both. So this is just an outline of where it is that I'm going to go with the presentation. That The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you a decent amount. I'm going to try to give you a sense of what the project is like, and give you a feel for what it is that we've been doing with this larger project. And I'm going to try to make that point about heterogeneous resources being critical to understanding these processes. And then after that, I'm going to show you another film, and I'm going to see if I can give you a sense of what I mean by film's capacity for representing or evoking embodied habits. 
And then I'll show you a third film, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the capacity of film for telling stories, for representing emotions, the strengths and the weaknesses of that. So this is the rough structure of what I'm going to do, three pieces to the presentation. So the first one has to do with the community itself and how we make sense of what's going on in a community like this. This timeline is meant to represent for you the historical trajectory. It turns out that last year was the 500th anniversary of um, the first landing in what's now Florida, the first landing of Europeans in what's now Florida. And so over this long period of time, many centuries, the relationship between what's now the United States and what's now Mexico has been evolving over time. There are certain particularly important points up there, like in 1848 was the treaty signing where the United States took over large regions of the country, what's now the Southwest and West, that used to be part of Mexico. So you've all heard the expression that for people who were Mexican, who were living there at the time, the notion is, is that they didn't cross the border, the border crossed us. So what happens is that there were people who were Mexican, and all of a sudden they were Mexicans living in America. And that phenomenon, that fact, which happened 150 years ago, continues to influence people. That people continue to think of themselves as people whom the border crossed, and that's an important component of identities and how it is that people are seen. We also had the Bracero program, which was a way to get let migrant labor into the United States. And that program, which went on over many decades, has also had an influence on how it is that people in the United States perceive Mexicans, how Mexicans perceive this country, what it means to immigrate here, what it means to come here from that kind of a background. There are also representations up here of some more recent developments having to do with the recent increase in immigration from Mexico to the US. So if you're going to make sense of what's going on in a town like Norristown, you have to know something about this history, because the history is relevant to the sense that people make of their own lives and of the lives of other groups of people that they encounter. This is another scale that's on a much shorter time scale. So I was just talking about something centuries long, processes that have taken centuries to unfold. Over the last 20 years or so, it's almost exactly 20 years now, it's often dated to the Mexican currency crisis that happened in 1994, that a particular phenomenon happened where people of Latino origin, but particularly Mexicans, started moving to and settling in parts of the United States that had not traditionally had Latino populations. So there are really nine, United, nine of the states in the United States that have traditionally been home to Latinos, basically the ones that used to be part of Mexico. And the other 40 or so are places where, in large cities, in Chicago, in New York, you've had Latino populations for centuries. But in suburban and rural areas of most states, and in all of many states, there just haven't traditionally been many Latinos. There have been migrant picking circuits where people largely from Mexico would come they would start picking lettuce in Texas in March or so, and then they would end up picking apples in Washington State or in Maine in October or November. So there were migrant circuits with Latinos moving through, but there weren't settled communities of Latinos. It tended to be single men who came through and picked and went home to Mexico for the winter and then started up again the next spring. But over the last 20 years, you've had this phenomenon where there are large numbers of Mexicans who have started settling all over the country. And the most the stories that we've seen the most about are in the Great Plains states, in Nebraska and Kansas and Iowa, where meatpacking is the primary occupation, and in the South, with Georgia, North Carolina, and other states like that, where there's been chicken processing has been the primary occupation. That this has to do with the change in how it is that agricultural enterprises do their work. It used to be you raised the cows in Nebraska, you put them on a train, they went to Chicago, and they got slaughtered and processed in Chicago. But then about 20 or 30 years ago, they moved the meatpacking plant out because it was a lot cheaper to have the meatpacking plant in Nebraska right next to the cows as opposed to shipping the cows all that way and paying for real estate in Chicago to do the processing. So they needed labor to do the meatpacking in Nebraska, and there weren't people there willing to do it or not enough. So what they did is they started importing labor, and a lot of it came from Mexico and Central America. What happened then is people started moving their families, so you got settled families settling in Nebraska and all over the country, and now it's happening literally in all 50 states, where all of a sudden you have many, especially Mexicans, but also other Latinos who are settling in these places. And the growth in many of these towns is dramatic. The statistics on this slide is in Norristown itself, the growth in the Mexican origin population over the last 20 years has been over 900%. The growth in the Hispanic population has been over 1,000% in this particular town. You all have probably heard of school districts. There are many, many school districts across the United States with numbers like 20 years ago, it was 2% Hispanic or Latino. 
and now it's 50% or 30% Hispanic or Latino. Sometimes that happens in just a few years. There are some towns in the South that have gone from 1% to 50% in five years or seven years. And so this growth rate is extraordinary, and these are interesting places because you have towns that have no real experience with or models of who these newcomers are. So it's a natural experiment. It's an experiment where people don't have the entrenched stereotypes that you find in most places where you have inter-ethnic kinds of relationships. All of a sudden, newcomers show up, and the people who've lived there longer really don't know what to make of them. They watch TV, they watch movies, so they have these stereotypes from TV and movies, but those stereotypes aren't entrenched and developed through decades of personal experience with themselves or people they know with this particular group. What it means is it means that there's a little bit more flexibility in terms of how it is that the immigrants can define themselves. They're not shunted so quickly into particular lines of identity. They have more opt opportunity to be different kinds of people. So we have the history of Latinos in the United States. That's relevant to making sense of what's happening in this town. But this town is a new Latino diaspora town, meaning it's a town where Latinos have just arrived. And because they've just arrived, there's this flexibility, there's this indeterminacy that you don't find in Los Angeles or Texas or other places like that. Even within the time period of 20 years across which this new Latino has ha diaspora has happened, where we've had Latino families settling in towns like this, there's been a substantial shift. In the 90s, even into the early 2000s, the modal person in a town like this was a single man. It was a bachelor who came by himself to work, and he was sending money back. There were also fragments of families, so there was a brother and a sister, there was a father and a couple of kids. That there were families that were more fragmented, so the typical person who was Mexican in a town like this was either a single man or part of one of these fragments of a family. There were some intact families, but that wasn't the norm. Over the last 10 years, it switched completely, so now the modal person the modal Mexican person in this town, and many towns like it across the country, is part of an intact young family. It's a person with parents often in their 20s and small children. And that's what you see when you wander around town nowadays, are families with kids. And that transition has only happened in the last 10 years or so, and it makes an enormous difference in terms of how people think of themselves, in terms of the experiences that people have, both members of the immigrant community and others around them. So this shift is another it's another complicating factor in trying to develop a general account of what's happening, trying to figure out what the crucial processes are and making sense of what's going on to children in towns like this. So here are a couple of pictures. This is the decade from 1990 to 2000. The darker spots are counties which have particularly rapid growth in the Hispanic or Latino population. The slightly less dark ones are moderate growth, and the ones with no color are ones that have very few Latinos living there. This is the same map for the next decade from 2000 to 2009. And so you can see the regions that we're talking about in the south, Georgia, North Carolina, South Carolina. There's some up through the mid-Atlantic, even up into Maine, Maine where I lived and did some research. It's where I first started doing research on this new Latino diaspora phenomenon back in my youth. Um, and then we have the Great Plains, the Midwest, where you have substantial numbers of people settling all the way down Arkansas, Oklahoma, and up through Nebraska, into Iowa, and even Minnesota. So this is, you can see it on the map, spatially what it is that's happening, where these kinds of phenomena are occurring. OK, another scale. So we've got the scale of Latinos in the United States over 500 years. We've got the scale of the new Latino diaspora over the last 20 years. And now we have a spatially limited scale of Norristown in, in particular. There's this particular town that we're talking about, and all towns are not the same. That in order to make sense of what's going on in this town, we need to understand something about its history, that it was incorporated in 1812, so 200 years ago, and it was a town that initially was, was settled by English and German, people of English and German origin. So I assume Mr. Norris was one of them, but there were these folks of English and German origin who settled in this town. They were all Protestants. But relatively soon thereafter, a few decades thereafter, Catholics started to move in, initially Irish Catholics. So you had many Irish Catholics who came in to work on railroads and other sorts of projects. And then you started having Catholic churches being, being developed. And then at the beginning of the 20th century, with the great waves of immigration, you had many people coming from Italy and people coming from other regions to settle in town. And eventually, as you move forward in the 20th century, that early in the 20th century, you had African Americans coming up from the south, part of that great migration. 
And then later in the 20th centuries, in the 60s and 70s, you had African Americans moving out from Philadelphia. And at the same time, in the 60s and 70s, you had Southeast Asians who were being recruited to work in various sorts of industries in the region. And eventually, you had Mexicans coming in the 90s. We'll learn a lot more about when the Mexicans came. So this particular town is different than many similar towns because it has a history of immigration. So the typical new Latino diaspora town, say way out in the middle of nowhere in Nebraska, is a town that has black people, it has white people, and it's been pretty stable in terms of its ethnic mix for a very long time. This town, Norristown, has had waves of immigrants across basically its entire history. But the last century, for sure, there have been many different kinds of people, a dozen different ethnic groups. At different times, there were Puerto Ricans, there were Koreans, there were Vietnamese, there were people from many parts of the world who came to this town because it has dense, relatively cheap housing in the downtown area, and it's centrally located as a transportation hub. Train lines intersect there, highways intersect there, so people were able to get to work in the whole surrounding region. It's also the county seat, and so it houses many social service agencies. So this particular town has a history of immigration, which changes its reaction to new immigrants. So when the Mexicans came, what happened is that many people remember their own immigrant roots there. That out in the middle of the prairie, Many, many people don't have as clear a sense of their immigrant roots because the families have been there for many generations. That in this town, pretty much anybody you stop, it's an overgeneralization, many of the people that you stop will be able to say, my grandmother came from Italy, or my mother came from Italy, or my mother came from Vietnam, or wherever it was that the particular person's family comes from. Most people in town remember their immigrant roots because somebody in their family has told them about it. That makes this place a little bit friendlier to the Mexicans than a, a, a similar town in other respects would be, just because people empathize with what it means to be an immigrant. Quick demographics on the town itself. Um, about 35,000 people in what's called the borough of Narstown, the downtown area of Narstown. And right now, it's about a third black, a third white, and a third Latino. Roughly speaking, that's how it is today. It's changed significantly over the last 20 years. I'll show you the graph in a minute. That in the school district, it's about 27 or 28 percent Latino now. And the school district has a pyramid. So at the top of the pyramid in high school, in the senior class or the junior class in high school, that it's only going to be 5 percent Latino or less. In the kindergarten across the school district, it's 40 percent Latino. So what's happening is you have many young people. I told you about the young families that we have, I won't show you the footage tonight, but we have the priest, we've done a lot of work with the local Catholic church that serves the Mexican community. And he says that last year they had about 250 baptisms and 248 of them were Mexican. So what's <laughs> happening is there are a lot of kids who are being born, young kids who are entering the school system. What this means is that this is gonna be a very different town 10 years from now than now. So now in the high school, your average Latino kid is a kid who doesn't have lots of other Latino kids around him, and is a kid who probably came a little bit later in his own life and his own ontogenetic trajectory. There are some Latino kids in the high school who were born in the US, but most of them weren't. But 10 years from now, every Mexican kid in the high school will have been born in the US, or almost everyone, and that's gonna make an enormous difference, an enormous difference in terms of how they identify culturally with their own identities, an enormous difference in terms of their English language skills. So things are changing very rapidly in this town. We can't be telling you that Norristown and towns like it are going to have X or can be characterized as X because X is changing very rapidly as the mix shifts over time. So here's just a picture of the demographics using um, the essentializations that we like to use for these sorts of reporting that you can see the decline in the white population being cut roughly in half and the rapid increase in the Hispanic, the Latino population over that period of time. So we've been there for nine years. It was nine years ago that I first went out to the town and met with the ESL coordinator and started working with um, various doctoral students who've worked, out, who've worked over there. And we have an enormous and unwieldy database that contains ridiculous amounts of information, only a fraction of which I've been able to do anything with. And someday I may be able to get back to much of it. Um, we've started working with film, which is what I want to talk to you about today. This slide summarizes several of the different kinds of projects that we've done, both research and service, research and practice oriented kinds of activities. So we've worked on Latino youth culture. I was just talking with Shirley about homies, little dolls that the kids like to carry around, which are part of Latino youth culture, that 
Elena Lard did a dissertation on students arriving mid-year from Mexico. What does it mean for the high school when kids show up in the middle of the year from Mexico? How does the school serve them and what would be more appropriate? Betsy did a study on the day of a life and day in the life of a Mexican immigrant student at one of the middle middle schools, following him around, seeing how, what kinds of language he used, what repertoires he drew on, and his English and his Spanish usage. Sarah Gallo um, did some studies of parent-teacher conferences together with Kathy Howard when Kathy was here. That Sarah and Holly Link, who's um, one of the coordinators of the forum here, are doing remarkable work following a cohort of. Mexican immigrant kids across K to four, so five years across an elementary school with a longitudinal database, observing them every year and giving a rich sense of what it is that's happening with them over the course of time. We've studied narratives of town history, asking people to tell us what the history of the town is and comparing across different people from different groups. So all of these research projects have gone on. As I was preparing this, I was counting up. There have been about a dozen doctoral students who have worked with me on this project over the last nine years, some for just a year, some for four years. Six dissertations are, have been done or are in progress in this particular town. So it's turned out to be a rich place for people to do work of various kinds. The practice side shows that we've done work on parent engagement. The school district wanted to work on how do we help Mexican parents get more engaged with the schools so that the schools can serve their children better. So we created Spanish language resource rooms with bilingual staff and them where parents could bring their kids and get homework help and get some advice about how to interact with the school. We created a parent leadership committee, um, which has been since co-opted by one of the schools because the principal was greedy. But when we did it, it was for parents across the school district who were Spanish -speak language speakers who wanted to come together and just the superintendents attended and listened to whatever it is that they wanted to share. My first foray into film was a simple documentary that just had parents speaking about their kids' experiences in the schools and giving advice to educators. Carlos is here. Carlos helped doing many of the interviews on that project. Sarah Gallo helped on that as well. We have the Spanish for Teachers workshops that Betsy did together with Ann Pomerantz um, on offering teachers a quick introduction on how, what sorts of basic Spanish language resources might they draw on to try to interact more effectively with kids and parents. We've done lots of in-service workshops of different kinds for teachers showing us our documentary films and other things. And we've also done various sorts of work. Um, ACLAMO is a local social service agency that has an Even Start program. Students have volunteered to teach parents in that program. That Obed Arango is here. Obed runs an arts organization for youth there, for Latino youth. And students, Carlos Ian McDermott, have volunteered to help out young men in that project in Obed Center. And Katie Roy has created work for adolescent girls, trying to give support groups for girls to work through some of their issues. So there's been a whole range of different service and research activities that we've done there. And we're continuing to try to work with various of these agencies and institutions to try to help out. So the central point I want to make conceptually about all this is that in order to make sense of what's going on in this town, you have to attend to several different kinds of resources that come from several different scales. The processes that they're drawn from are occurring at different temporal and spatial scales. So there's the historical relationship between the United States and Mexico, which involves political and economic realities in terms of domination and access to resources. It includes different kinds of ideologies or models of personhood that are attached to different kinds of people. In models of workers, for instance, created by the Bracero program. We have the new Latino diaspora, which is this 20-year-long phenomenon that involves much more flexibility than you would find. I often say it makes a huge difference if you're a 15-year-old Mexican kid and you move to the United States. It makes a huge difference if you go to LA or if you go to a place like Norristown. In LA, everybody knows what they think of you, whether it's good or it's bad. But in Norristown, a lot of people don't know what to think of you because they just don't know what people like you are like. They're getting more entrenched views, but those views are still relatively fluid. Communities are at different points in this trajectory. So in South Philadelphia here, the Mexican community is newer than the community in Norristown. It really started ramping up 10 years or so ago. So there, things are even a little more fluid. In Kennett Square, which is a community where they pick mushrooms, they first started recruiting Mexicans to come pick mushrooms about 40 years ago. And so there, there, there are two generations of American-born Mexican, Mexican origin kids. And that's a community that has a much longer history, a more entrenched vision of who folks are and how they make sense of them. So the new, the new Latino diaspora is relevant to making sense of this town. But even within that category, we have to make sense of what this particular town is experiencing. 
as I said, the fact that there are these Italian immigrants who in many ways are similar to the Mexicans, at least in their view. They're family-centered, they tend to be Catholic, the languages are somewhat mutually intelligible. I've observed several conversations where someone's speaking Italian and someone's speaking Spanish back and they claim to understand each other. I can't understand a word of Italian, but Spanish speakers, I guess, who can really speak the language properly, claim that they can understand Italian speakers, and it's apparently relatively easy. It's easier for the Italian speakers to understand the Spanish. So the similarity in language and culture and values, they're very family-centered societies, both of them, makes many of these Mexicans more sympathetic to the Mex many of the Italians more sympathetic to the Mexican immigrants than you would find of the average Anglo person out there in the average town where Mexican people are moving. So the fact that it's this town, which ha just happens to have a large Italian-American population, makes a difference. Parenthetical comment. Do not refer to an Italian person as an Anglo, contrasting them with a Latino that is a Mexican. That's the way many of us would tend to think of this, because Italians are construed nowadays as white. But in fact, I've been yelled at more than once by Italians in this town who explained to me that where did Latin come from? Where was Latin the language developed and spoken? Italy, right? So what are you doing calling me an Anglo and that person a Latino? This is just a word of advice if you're going to interact with Italians. The immigrant community itself in this town has changed over a time scale of only a decade or less than a decade from bachelors, mostly single men, to intact families. And now many of the intact families are mixed status families where the children are American citizens. And pretty soon we're going to have families where the Mexican origin parents, the Mexican American parents, are themselves US citizens. And so there's changing in terms of what kind of person is modal. And that influences how the, how the community is perceived and how people in the community view themselves. There's also, it's important to see the intersection of these different trajectories. So the community itself is moving through time and changing rapidly, as I've described in various ways, as Mexican families become more settled, and so forth and so on. Individuals enter the community at different points in their ontogenetic trajectory. So it's very different to come as a Mexican child at age five than at age 15. If you arrive at age 15, you're thrown into a high school, which is ramping up for tests every day, and you can't speak the language, and you're at a serious disadvantage. If you come at age five, then relatively quickly, within a few years, you're able to adjust learning the language in an elementary school environment that's much more sympathetic, that's much friendlier to you. So if we want to make sense of a phenomenon like the ontogenetic trajectory, the projected trajectory of a particular kid, a particular Mexican origin kid in this community, we have to take into account resources from all of these scales in order to make sense of what's happening. I think the most useful conceptual framework for trying to do this comes from Bruno Latour. So what he says is that it's very dangerous to adopt predetermined scales and to apply those scales to a phenomenon like this. Whatever your favorite pet theory is, so I put neoliberalism up there. I really hope that's not your favorite pet theory, but if that is, then I want to tell you that you can't just take that and apply it to whatever is going on in the world. This is maybe a route to academic success. One of the routes to success in the academic economy is developing a pet theory and then trying to use it to gobble up all the other theories. You know, So your neoliberalism can eat my whatever it is that I'm trying to push today. And so that process of trying to maintain academic success by applying your favorite thing to everything, the most successful people, because this is a fashion system, it changes rapidly, the hemlines go up and down. And so the most successful people are doing neoliberalism today and hegemony tomorrow and whatever the latest thing is to, on the next day. So the most successful way is to jump from one pet thing to another. But at any given stage, they're trying to show how everything is neoliberalism or everything is hegemony or everything is whatever it is we're on to nowadays. So that's a strategy for success in the academy. So giving you advice about how to succeed in the academy, absolutely go for it. But if you actually want to understand the world, it's not a particularly productive strategy. And the reason it's not a productive strategy is that the world is too heterogeneous and it changes too fast. So there are these different sorts of scales that are moving. And what you need to do, I've also put up there turn-taking. There are some people who at least used to think that turn-taking explained everything. And narratives as another one that people like and apply. So I have nothing against neoliberalism, turn-taking, and narratives. Actually, I'm lying. I have something against neoliberalism. I'm sick of it. But I have nothing <laughs> against turn-taking and narratives, or habitus, or whatever your favorite pet issue is. I have nothing against it, honestly. I think that they're perfectly useful concepts for making sense of certain kinds of phenomena. What I'm saying that you don't want to do is you don't want to act as if that particular account can be an account that makes sense of everything you want to go after. 
because everything you want to go after is diverse, it's heterogeneous. And one of the principles here is that in order to make sense of anything interesting and complex, you actually need resources from several different scales. So a phenomenon like a kid in this town who's moving through an ontogenetic trajectory and we want to know what the constraints and affordances are for that particular child moving on into life, in order to make sense of a complicated process like that, you're going to need to take into account things from large scales, like the history of Mexicans in the United States, from local scales, like this town and the fact that there are Italian people in this town, and also from specific events and things. The particular family the child ends up in, the particular school and so forth can also make a difference. So what Latour says is he has a very minimalist ontology. He's not out there multiplying lots of objects like habituses and neoliberalisms and turn-taking patterns. And what he's doing is he's saying that in any given moment, in any given phenomenon or process we want to make sense of, there is constructed a set of relationships among heterogeneous kinds of resources that come together in a network, which is what facilitates that particular phenomenon or that particular process. That network is an evanescent thing in the sense that it functions to make this particular object or process possible, but it does not persist in the same way and explain everything else that falls into some class like that. That the network has to be made sense of for the particular thing that you're after, and it probably is going to be fundamentally different for another object, even an object that has some similarities to it. So you have to expect heterogeneity in the kinds of networks that are going to explain what it is that you're trying to focus on and explain, and you have, to, you have to expect that the kinds of resources relevant to your explanations as a social scientist are going to vary from one phenomenon, one object, to another. So heterogeneous resources constituting contingent networks. I've already said much of this with respect to Norristown. So if we apply this kind of a theory to Norristown, what we see is that the community itself has several different stages. And it makes a big difference which stage we're making sense of and it makes a big difference when you as an individual arrived. The first stage will see the first Mexican immigrant. We have the last film is about her. So the first 16 years or so of the Mexican immigrant community in this town was a very small networked group of people who had a significant amount of cultural capital and had cultural brokers to help them. In 1994, all of a sudden, you had an explosion of mostly single men, but other fragments of families that showed up. And now, as I've said, we're in the phase of having families were having settled families of people. The ontogenetic development of any individual, as I said, when you enter, what age you arrive makes a big difference, but also which phase the town was in when you arrived. So even if two kids arrived at age 15, if one of them arrived in 1990 at age 15 and another one arrived in 2010 at age 15, it's different because the community itself was fundamentally different at those two different moments. In 2010, people understood who Mexicans were. The schools had ramped up to try to do something for the Mexican kids. In 1990, you were a complete oddball if you showed up as a Mexican kid at age 15. OK, so what's going to happen is we're going to have emerging relationships among these kinds of heterogeneous resources, which are what facilitate whatever phenomenon or process it is that we're trying to make sense out of. That's what I want to say. So what I want to do in this project is, if someday I actually get time to look at this database and write something about this project, that what I'm going to want to do is I'm going to want to try to describe some of these heterogeneous networks, the kinds of heterogeneous resources that are formed into networks that allow the kinds of processes I'm after. That's what I want to do as a social scientist. That's the sort of project I want to be able to illustrate for you. I've got all sorts of ethnographic detail. I've got all sorts of theoretical concepts that I think I can use to make sense of stuff. And the question for the rest of the talk is, so can I use film as a medium to represent that? What's film good for in trying to do this job of representing these kinds of complicated processes and objects that I'm trying to represent? So what I want to do is I want to show you two more films. And after each one, we'll talk about one dimension of what the films are good at or not good at. talk to you about <clears throat> using this film as an illustration has to do with embodiment, with embodied dispositions. That the point is that film is particularly good at representing a certain layer of human activity, part of what makes human activity meaningful. And we can take advantage of this affordance by using film to represent some of these things. 
in order to give you a sense of what I mean, I need to talk a little bit about phenomenology. So we have a tendency, all accounts of human behavior, both folk accounts and academic accounts, take some prototype of what counts as the basic kind of human activity. You all know that famous sculpture, the thinker, you know, where the guy's sitting there with his hand. And there's this notion in many areas of social science that fundamentally what people do is we think. In anthropology, sociology, sometimes these theories are articulated in terms of symbols and meanings. So the notion is, is that what's fundamental to people and how they make experience meaningful is a set of symbols. Often they're shared across cultural groups, we imagine. But people think about stuff, and the way that life is meaningful for us is because we use these symbols, we use conscious reflection in order to make sense of whatever it is that we're experiencing. Now, I'm all for symbols. Symbols are fine, and conscious reflection happens sometimes. It has its uses. But from a phenomenological point of view, that all of that is derivative from or rests upon a background of other kinds of activity that is more basic to making sense of what experience is for us. The terms that often get used here in phenomenology are the pre-objective or pre-reflective experience. The notion is, is that what's basic to human activity is the kind of thing that allows us to, for instance, get a joke or grasp a gesture or dance successfully with another person, that sometimes a gesture can't be translated. If somebody makes a gesture that's particularly appropriate at a given moment to caption, capture whatever it is they're trying to communicate, and you later on are trying to explain to somebody what was done, that oftentimes you can't do it except by recreating the gesture, because the gesture is something you just get or you just don't get. It's like a joke. You just get it or don't get it. You have to explain your jokes to somebody. It's no fun, right? If somebody has to get the joke explained to them, it's no longer a joke. It's some sort of analytic activity. That the joke rests on a series of tacit understandings, and these understandings are the same kinds of things that allow us, say, to dance successfully with another person. I'm speaking here vicariously. I can't really do that myself. But that people who can dance successfully, what they do is they're able to orient their bodies in response to what someone else is doing. It involves a kind of coordination that doesn't involve conscious reflection. If you have to think about it, you can't do it. You have to just be able to engage in it. And so that kind of a process, of being able unreflectively to engage in an activity that's meaningful and coordinated is the kind of thing that phenomenologists are talking about. And the claim here is that human activity, the meaningfulness of it, rests upon a background of those sorts of tacit embodied understandings. So that when we're able to do things that are meaningful to us, even academic things, that I've had people come up to me sometimes and say, so what's it like to give a lecture like that? You're pretty fluent. How is it that you're able to talk like that? Can you teach me to do that? And I often say that, you know, it's kind of like turning a switch. That what happens is I figure out what I'm going to say, and then I turn a switch, and it just comes out. And the, what comes out is not me sitting up here thinking, gee, I'm going to make that point next or this point next. The PowerPoint gives you a picture of what the next slide is. I'm never looking at that. It just has to come out. For it to go well, it just has to flow. And that flowing is not because I have a series of mental representations in my head that contain all the symbols of the propositions that I'm going to say. It's because it's kind of like dancing. It's just an activity where I'm able to orient myself, in this case it's verbally, to be able to articulate things that come out in a way that's able to communicate clearly. And that kind of a process is something that can't be captured purely in terms of symbols or propositions or beliefs or conscious reflection. It's some other layer of activity that we all are able to engage in. And it's something that, from a phenomenological point of view, constitutes the background of activity, such that conscious reflection, which clearly happens, we do step back and reflect on things, but that process is dependent on the background that sits underneath it and allows it to be meaningful and allows it to take place. And so people who say that the fundamental human condition is to be a thinker, that an unreflected <clears throat> You know, Socrates was talking about how a life that you don't reflect on is not worth living, right? And people nowadays in various cognitive sciences spend their time talking about how it is that symbol processing, propositional activity, is the fundamental human state. If we can make sense of representation and how humans represent things, we can understand what at core we are. That's clearly wrong because that activity rests on this background of other kinds of tacit 
unreflected things. And in principle, you could never articulate all the things that are required to make even an academic theory, academic activity meaningful. Because there's an, um, it's like turtles all the way down, that there's this level of stuff that you can't ever fully articulate. Okay, so if that's right, and I happen to think it is right, that it doesn't mean we shouldn't study symbols, it doesn't mean we shouldn't study reflection, all that stuff is good, it means we also have to study these tacit habits that make possible what it is that people are doing. So when Bourdieu talks about habitus, he's after this layer of human activity, his contribution was to show that it's systematically distributed across social fractions. So it's not just that I have my own sort of tacit, embodied, pre-reflective ways of making sense, but actually people who are like me along various dimensions are gonna share many of those dispositions. So that level of activity is something we need to make sense of. And the basic claim that I want to make here is that film is really good at capturing that. It's very difficult to capture that level of thing in prose, but it's much easier to capture it in film. So when you watch the restaurant work that Arminda is doing in that restaurant, you can see the care she takes in it, and you can see the skill that goes into it, and the hard work, the effort that's required, that her capacity to just touch one of the potatoes and know when something is done, what she has to do in order to cut up various things and put them together into these complicated things that she's cooking, that requires this sort of tacit embodied capacity. She's resting on a background of these kinds of capacities that is not primarily a conscious or a cognitive thing. And you could see it, you could feel it when you saw it going, that as Ahmed and Aaron edited this film, you saw that they sped up a little bit some of the edits when they were getting to the section where they were talking about the financial pressure that they were under in this restaurant. And I hope that you felt at that point, I felt at that point, you could kind of feel the pressure, you know? You could feel that it was building up the activity that they had to engage in, the work they had to engage in. You could see in their faces, the circles under their eyes, these people got up at 3.30 in the morning, every morning in order to open that restaurant at 5 or 5.30. On Sundays, they slept in until 5.30 because they didn't open until 7 or so. So seven days a week, they were getting up at that hour of the morning in order to get themselves there. And they were doing it because of the financial pressure and because of just the physical demands of producing that much food and having to do it all themselves because they didn't have a staff of people doing it. The family was doing it. So that sort of pressure, the work that was involved in it, I hope is something that the film evoked in you, that you could feel almost viscerally as you watched what it was that was going on. You could also feel a little bit the presence of Mimi, their daughter, who had died and that they named the restaurant after. So film is really better at capturing this level of stuff if we get beyond the notion that people are fundamentally cognitive beings, fundamentally thinking beings. I'm not saying people don't think. People do think, well, some people think more than others, but people do think, basically, that's one of the activities we engage in. But if we get past the notion that that's the fundamental level of human experience, then we don't want to mediate all of our accounts through these explicitly conceptualizing media, like writing. When you write something, we always tell people, those of us who teach writing, writing is thinking, right? When you write something, you actually understand it better because you force yourself to think through some of the issues as you do it. That's a great strength. It can force people to be reflective, but it has a weakness too. The weakness is, is that what comes out is something that you have to reflect about in a way that makes us think that that sort of reflective activity is basic. And film doesn't have that presupposition built into it. Film actually takes a lot of reflective work in order to put something like this together on the part of the filmmaker. But on the part of the viewer, it can be grasped in a more immediate way that allows us to communicate some of these other dimensions. So this is the first point. What's film good for? If some of the heterogeneous kinds of scales and resources that we're interested in articulating when we give an ethnographic account are of this tacit embodied nature, part of the background, part of what it is that makes meaningful experience possible, then film is a pretty good medium to represent those dimensions of what we're trying to get at. So I'm going to show you one more film, and then we'll talk about one more topic. So, after this one, I, talk, I want to talk a little bit about storytelling and emotion, that films are often built around stories, that this particular film tells the story of the first Mexican immigrant. We don't claim that she was the first Mexican person ever to pass through Norristown or even the first one to live there, 
but she seems to have been the first person to settle and attract others such that the community coagulated around her. She reports that when she arrived in 1978, for the first 10 years, she could stop any Mexican person she met in town and trace them back to her. So however many degrees of separation it was, she could figure out whether it was her sister or her cousin or somebody who had told them or told somebody who told them and so forth and so on. So you, hear, you get to see the story here of that family. You hear about how Charlie met her initially and brought her there, how her siblings followed her, and a little bit of the story of her older brother and her older brother's son, who ended up running for city council. So stories are told effectively through this kind of a medium. And it's important to see that films are good at this, that Amin and I are always having disagreements. They're friendly disagreements. But I'm always wanting to put in voiceovers about Foucault or something of the sort. And he's always saying to me, you're not putting that into my film, that nobody's going to watch it. So we have this issue where, from an academic point of view, I have this urge to stick lots of academic argumentation in there. But from the perspective of making a film that's a decent film, you have to worry more about the story you're telling and how you hold that story together. It's important that the film, it's not that the film doesn't have an argument, it's just that the argument is embedded in the story and the relative proportions of story compared to argument are a little different for your typical film than for your typical academic paper. As ethnographers, we tell stories too, and sometimes some of our articles or books are built around stories, so stories are foregrounded, but there tends to be a little more argumentation relatively and a little bit less storytelling than you get in the typical film. So, First, important to see that there are different kinds of films and different kinds of other products too, articles, texts of various kinds. These different kinds of products, films say, can include stories to a different extent. And the questions on the bottom this, of this slide are meant to raise this issue of, so is it dangerous? Is it a bad thing to be telling too many stories? In other words, can you present a film like this that's got too much story in it, and therefore it doesn't do a good job at presenting whatever sort of academic research that we're trying to present? People worry about this. It's because there's something a little seductive about film. It feels unmediated. So when you have something like this presented, it feels as if you're seeing reality, as if reality is hitting you directly that we know that that's not true, that the filmmaker spent Lord knows how many hours sorting through this footage, picking things out, arranging it in an artful way, but that doesn't change how it feels. It feels much more immediate than you can ever do, even the best writers can manage in text. So there's something a little bit seductive, a little bit worrisome about that from the perspective of nerds who want to think that we can control everything through academic sorts of reflection and presentation. I hear there are some nerds in the audience. <laughs> Welcome. Um, so, <laughs> emotion has roughly the same kind of a story to go with it that you, you could feel in this. There are scenes of people crying. Arminda, in the second film, was crying when she was thinking about her daughter who had died. And in this one, Lupe was crying with joy when her son brought his diploma to her and gave her his diploma. That you can feel this family. Um, when I first met these sisters, Maria and her sister, Marisa and Becky, when I first met them, that we had made a date actually just with Becky. So we threw somebody, we met somebody who suggested Becky, she agreed to meet us, and I expected to sit down just with Becky. Carlos Martinez was there, Carlos was with me, and Kathy Lee, who was another doctoral student working on the project. And they showed up, all three of them. So all three sisters showed up, and it was very characteristic that they do things together, that family is really critical in this particular culture. And so you could get a feel for that when you feel them interacting with each other at these sorts of events, the love they feel for each other and the closeness that comes. Coming from a very sparse Anglo family with Protestant background, this is very alien to me. But the Mexicans have been welcoming and have tried to sort of indoctrinate me a little bit into this new sort of interaction with people. The film is able to capture or grab this, these emotions, and it's able to show them to you in a way that you just couldn't do in text. And again, there's the same sort of worry about it, that isn't film dangerous? Can't it be used for propaganda? Can't we manipulate people's emotions as a way that as a way of pushing them away from the analytic reflection, the critical reflection that we're really after as academics. And that's a concern that many people try to, that many people articulate that they worry about in these kinds of contexts. So what I want to say about it briefly is I want to answer in a Latourian way that there are many different kinds of ethnographic objects and they, re they require different configurations of resources. So some films foreground stories more and some of them foreground stories less. 
There's always some story, but there can be more or less. And for different objects, we want more and less of that. There's films that really play upon emotions, and then there are some that don't do that as much. And for different kinds of objects, for different kinds of purposes, I think we need different kinds of configurations. And I also say here at the bottom of the slide that film by itself isn't the only medium one can imagine. I mean, what I'm inflicting on you this evening, this presentation is hybrid. It involves text and talk and film. And that sort of a hybrid sometimes can be more effective in terms of getting across what we want. We, we're experimenting, Amit and I and several of the doctoral students are experimenting with uh, calling these things filmlets, these little short films, and we're trying to build an e-book, a book that contains some short films like this. Some versions of these are going to end up in a book, which is going to be an electronic book that will include the film, and it will be playable on an iPad or some other kind of a device. And of course, there are diagrams and photos and slideshows and hyperlinks and other sorts of technologies that we can use in order to try to communicate and create these multimedia objects to do whatever it is we're trying to do. So I've been talking a lot about film, but I mean that we want to do this in not just film, but film plus these various other media. So to wrap up, ethnography, I think, is a lot, ethnography is a good method for getting at contingent configurations of resources. It's a good method for getting at complicated objects that are particular, that aren't about everything in general but are about a particular place and the meanings and understandings that people in a particular place have. I say here that regularities emerge from the bottom up. Good ethnography stays close to the ground. It stays close to the things you actually see and hear from people. And so we are attuned to these kinds of heterogeneous resources. And my slogan here is, you have to expect multiple resources, heterogeneous resources, and various configurations. If your analysis ends up with two scales, we have neoliberalism and we have interactional construction, then I'm sure there's something wrong. That there are a few objects in the world that that's the kind of analysis you need, but they probably all have been studied already. So if you want to do an analysis, what you want is you want an analysis that has several different kinds of resources from several different scales, because that will be more appropriate. And I've tried to say about multimedia representations that they're able to capture this embodied background, the sorts of tacit dispositions that make possible the kinds of meaningful activity that we engage in. And there are both strengths and dangers to the capacity for storytelling, the capacity to evoke emotion that film brings. And I've tried to recommend that you use multiple formats, that you consider multiple sorts of tools and presentations that you do. So I just want to thank our convener, Nancy, the coordinators, the IT, the staff. Thanks again to Amit and Aaron for their great job in putting together these films. I've enjoyed working with them. We have a documentary, Noam Osband has directed a documentary, the link is up there, called Adelante, which will be distributed, available through the distributor relatively soon. You can see the trailer on the website and learn a little bit about that film. And thanks to Camera, the organization I put up here, John Jackson, who kindly talked to me the other day about several of these ideas and helped me work out some of these things. Matt, Sophia, and all the other students who are part of that, thank you guys for doing your work. I appreciate it, and thank you all for coming.
for the various reasons that were mentioned today. Uh, first, from the symbolic anthropology, uh, I think there are certain things. I love to do ethnography using film. We used to do it in the 1990s in Mexico to the hermeneutical department. And always the question was fragmentation. You know, we fragment. You capture certain things and you fragment other things. No? But in my opinion, it's not different as when Clifford Gilles used to say the here and there, in which you are narrated, you are fragmented to. It's just a different language. In my opinion, we are using a visual, a visual auditive language. Then how we call and we narrate, we have to accept it in the subjectivity. I don't think that we have to search objectivity. If, if that is the search, I think we will fail. It has to be subjective. It has to be narrative. I don't know what you think about that, Dr. Wharton, but that is my, in that point. In the second point is the symbolic. When, when, the, uh, when Mr. Roberto then say, I have a plan for another business, and I will make it, I will go directly to the symbol of Mimi, because the business was called Mimi, as the daughter that passed away. And somehow, that symbol triggers inside the person. The business was called Mimi, the idea of the family was around Mimi, Perhaps the idea of creating something new, it has a symbol there. And I think, in my findings, is that symbols becomes very important into the identity of the new community. I call it, I call it the immigrant village, the Villa Immigrante, that that is the project that I'm working on. In that immigrant village, the identity, the symbols, it builds up who we are and who we want to be. And uh, the name Secate in itself, it has a symbol. Uh, Kate, it is, it is a name Kate. Why it would have a female Anglo name? No? For a Hispanic organization, it has a symbol. Therefore, I, I, I really encourage that has to go into the symbolic elements now that we are building that I I village. And the third thing, it was uh, related with the, with the findings in the education. And, uh, and uh, I, I really love how you narrated the transformation of the town from the bachelor men to the established families. Because that is what is going. Uh, Obed, uh, he's part of the reading group in the community center. And now I think that you should be, because I said in all those parties, <laughs> last week, last Saturday, we have, perhaps for the first time, members of Norris Town, members of Blue Bell, and members of the students' interns of SECATE, gathering together for the next year of the Cultural Center. Now they are bridging with the surrounding communities. And uh, then that is my comment, hopefully. I articulate something. <laughs> and I don't like English either. So I <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you. There were other questions. I mean, there are. Thank you very much for a fascinating talk. I also work with film, so I was very interested. I would like you to tell us a little bit more how you work with the film unit or the filmmaker. Uh, what do you say to them? Do you have a particular agenda that you give them, or they are free, or how do you work with them? What is the working relationship with these people? It's difficult because by nature I'm a solitary misanthrope, but working in film has forced me to try to engage with teams of people because I just don't have the skills to do this work by myself. And so it's been challenging just because of my personality, but it's been fun to work with the filmmakers. In this particular case, Amit has been making films for decades, and so he has a vision of how it is that he goes about doing it and what he's aiming for, but he and I sat down and we talked about, he wanted to know, so what kinds of themes is it that you're interested in academically? 
and can you explain those to me? And then we started to talk about it. He said, well, I can sort of see a story that involves this kind of line, and does that connect to what you're talking about? And I would have to say, well, I don't quite see that, and we would have to go on and try to work through it. And so it's a back and forth where I'm bringing my perspective on what kind of academic points I want, and Ahmed is bringing his vision of, he can only work with things that he can see. You know, you can't show something unless you have it on footage. And so he has to try to see what sorts of kernels he has that he can use, and we have to kind of work out, we have to calibrate what he's got and what it is that I want to do and whether these things can work. And so far it's been fun. I mean, I don't know if he would say it's been fun, but from my perspective, it's been fun to learn about this new medium, and it's a different way of thinking. And I've always been relatively visual, so I can see these things relatively well. That comes somewhat naturally. But the craft of how you put together a film is something that's completely new and alien to me, and so that's something I'm having to work on as I go along. Do you want to say something on it or not? Um, I think that uh, um, I suppose was the word iterating <laughs> back and forth. Um, there are two disciplines that I'm trying to work to, together. I think uh, from the filmmaker's standpoint, again, I have to look for things that I can see and hear. But what I think actually happened during the project was that, um, as what happens with practically all the documentaries I've ever worked on, is that you start at one place and you end up somewhere completely different. Um, in fact, actually, um, when we started, Noam was supposed to do the ethnography, and we were supposed to do the broadcast PBS documentary. There were two things that we were going to do. What happened was that he's cranked up the documentary, and I became an ethnographer. Uh, yeah. Simply because um, there, there are small discoveries that you go along the way, like um, with the Nogeba family, this wonderful, warm family, but they also have what I call this impregnable wall of niceness. You know, you, you know because uh, as a storyteller, I'm trying to get behind, the, I'm trying to get, you know, what's going on behind, or where was the problem, where's the conflict, remember what the conflict? Kind of nuts, you know, you know, smiling. They're always together. We couldn't get an interview with them, a single interview. Uh, the interviews we get are like are three, which is chaos when it comes to like editing. So you have to change and you have to adapt. So what we're so in fact, what you're seeing really is emerging from the material, and this is only the first rollout. We're actually testing forms. We don't know whether this works. Um, what we think will happen is that our main film will be about um, Ellie's election campaign. So in effect, in, in effect, this what you've seen is the sort of prelude to Ellie standing for, ele for election and all that went on. And then this is the backstory. And for a filmmaker, the great advantage of this is that, you know, if you shoot all this footage, 90% of it nobody gets to see. So with the, the e-book exercise, the idea is that everything could hopefully